firstly, Charles, just thinking of this subject, you know, as a whole, what do you think? What do you, what comes to your mind when you hear how Africa underdeveloped Africa? Okay, so when I first heard the the term how Africa underdeveloped Africa, well, it, it wasn't strange to me. It wasn't strange to me because I'm all too familiar with the way things are being run currently. You understand with the, with the corruption, with the nepotism, with the tribalism, and all the all the isms that you can think about, and not the racism? what it has led. Not the racism. Uh, no, not the, ra not the racism. One. Not the racism. Where where is the racism? <laughs> so that one is out of it. Um, but I I know that when we say how Africa underdeveloped Africa, we're more we're talking more in an historical sense, not currently. We're talking more maybe in the colonial period. You understand, uh, or the pre-colonial per period. Now going through the articles, the first article there was something that was of note, something interesting that I I saw in that article, where the writer states claimed that underdevelopment is sort of the default state of many societies. Mm. And that development is a recent, relatively recent uh, phenomenon. Now, that's something I hadn't thought about before. And I, I thought he made a good case for, for that scenario. I thought he made a good case for that argument that uh, most human societies are, are underdeveloped. I mean, the most of human development we've seen has been in the last maybe 200, 250 years. So for the most of human history, underdevelopment was sort of the norm. So to claim that a particular people or a particular system underdeveloped a people might not be accurate because how can you cause something that's already in existence? You understand? So we can say the, the colonial masters, the, the British, the, the Europeans, did they, uh, in a way, did their interference with African development? Uh, did it have any effects on the natural progression of, of the, Af the African people? Possibly. We can't say for sure that, yes, I mean, I, prior to when we started, I, I, I give you a situation. I, I, when I read the title of the article that where it said, is uh, European intervention the only reason, the only reason for African underdevelopment? Well, only. It can't be the only reason, if at all. Because we have seen that there are other societies that the Europeans interacted with that turned out okay. They turned out okay. So it couldn't possibly be that intervention alone led to the current situation we find ourselves. It may have, yes, certainly has yeah, had an effect. I did think it had some, some negative effects in African development. But to what extent, that's something I cannot confidently tell. And also, I think that there was a missed opportunity for Africa because uh, there were new ideas that were brought into the African continent, just as those new ideas were brought into the Asian continent by the Europeans. And somehow they were able to, to run with it. There was a time that Japan was, Japan was isolated from most of the world and Japan was, was very underdeveloped. But <clears throat> the leaders of Japan knew that Japan had to come what did they do? They opened up trade. They, you know, they just let, you know, they let, they let themselves into the world and they developed rapidly. You understand? So I think that Africa missed that opportunity, the opportunity of, you know, now being integrated into a global system to actually take off. I don't know how we, how we ever missed that, but I think we did miss that. That's very interesting because um, I think some people would argue that the consequences or the effects of colonialism still um, are still relevant today and even with that I, I obviously I don't believe that European intervention per se is the sole um, reason for the underdevelopment in many parts of Africa and I always want to make sure I say that bit correctly because I don't believe Africa as a whole is underdeveloped and poor just as I don't believe that the whole of Europe is developed and rich because we know once you go towards the eastern parts of, the, of Europe, you will see that actually it's far from developed. And even other um, specific places in the world where they still live even nomadic lifestyles. So I don't like this sort of overgeneralization that Africa is poor and Europe is rich because that's a misconceptualization of the, of the matter. But the majority or a large part of Africa is poor. 
And many people don't seem to explore other reasons as to why that may be the case. As, I mean, we had a conversation, well, a brief conference, we messaged each other before um, coming on and you asked me, well, who thinks the, this thing? And I was thinking, who doesn't think this thing? Because I guess in London, it's a bit, or in the UK anyway, it's a big talking point. I mean, once you bring in the topic of, of, of racism, give it five, 10 minutes and the topic of Africa will come in and what Europe has done and what Europe is still doing today. Don't get me wrong, I do believe that there is, and there is evidence that there is still some exploitative behaviours going on, whether that be directly or indirectly. Yes, we can blame um, the lack of institutional integrity in many African countries. We can allude to that, but people, um, I think some countries in the West do take advantage of that, um, which in which in turn enriches their country and leaves Africa in its current state. Um, nevertheless, I do believe that more emphasis should be placed on what, how or how the internal systems are within these African countries. You mentioned that we missed um, an opportunity for trade. I, I do believe that as well, but I do believe that there are other things such as geographical, such as geography, such as um, climate, such as um, this internal politics, the culture, the customs that we literally don't discuss anyway in the UK, um, I believe in America as well, that we need to talk about a little bit more. For example, this art, this blog by OK Chigbo, um, who's a writer that basically, you know, um, explored this area of Africa under development. Um, he's not refuting or denying the, like also you mentioned, the consequences of colonization. But I think he wants to focus a little bit more about in relation to how Africa and its systems and its people don't help matters, right? So he definitely rebuts the argument that um, development is, is some sort of automatic right um, that all countries um, should have and should enjoy. And as you mentioned, development is a is, is a fairly new phenomenon um I, well around 200 years ago yes the we started to see the beginning of the industrialization and the moving away of the agra agrarian agrarian sort of culture and then only around 70 years ago that's when you saw the mass ex, mass um consumption excessive consumerism but even in that time, there were still many, many parts of Europe and many, many parts in America that were in extreme poverty without basic necessities. So, and in the article, I would just quote it, read it here. So if Europeans themselves were, quote unquote, underdeveloped until just yesterday, then European in intervention is a far from necessary condition for anyone or any country to be underdeveloped. Because if underdevelopment is the normal condition of humankind through the ages and all people start out from that condition and may just continue in that state of affairs for a very long time, even into the present, then it's not necessarily something imposed on them from outside. It's their natural state. So it's not a country is not basically underdeveloped because someone has gone in there and done something. Sometimes it's just the case that that is the natural condition of that country doesn't mean that we fold our arms and say well it's the natural order of things let's move on and be happy with life but we won't be able to see more much more progress if we have the wrong ideas to begin with yeah yeah and when you say okay europe underdeveloped africa what exactly did they underdevelop what did they destroy what structures um what sort of technologies what's uh, well, we can make a case for say, okay, there were some systems that may have been destroyed, but in terms of science, in terms of, in terms of technology, in terms of, um, you know, just basic infrastructure and all that, what were those sorts of development that were on ground before the Europeans came that the Europeans destroyed, that they decimated, you understand? Yes, they had impact on our cultural norms, on our ways of life, on our ways of doing things, uh, 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 maybe our religion, uh, forms of government and all that. But in terms of other forms of development, what, what was there that was destroyed? You get, because when you're saying underdeveloped, you, you underdeveloped a place, that's, that's an active process. 
you're destroying something you get we can make an argument for altered the development the natural development slowed or accelerated the natural development but to say underdeveloped i think that's uh, it's not the right word to be using uh, and for those people who always default to well europe and the developed africa and all that you ask yourself that where is the agency yes where is the agency there it is it is it solely is it squarely on the on the shoulders of the europeans that they on the develop this place it's you cannot put it squarely on the shoulders of that's why i asked you who thinks who thinks who who even thinks that european colonialism is the only reason why africa is not developed <laughs> That certainly is not the only reason. Come to Africa, you see that there are a lot of jungles, for example. So that makes um, trade very difficult. That makes you know, movements between cities, between places, very difficult. So in, in that sort of society, how, how do societies um, develop mutual trade? I'm not saying there were no mutual trades in, in most of Africa, but our forests are actually very dense. Our forests are dense compared to maybe mountainous regions or compared to plains and, and some other things in other parts of other parts of the world. So you have to also take into consideration the geographical uh, peculiarities of, of Africa. And I believe that different societies develop at different at a different pace. When the Egyptian civilization were uh, at the at the peak of human civilization, you could ask yourself where were the Europeans? Or where the Mediterranean civilizations were at the peak, where were the Germanic tribes? I mean, the the Romans, the Romans actually called the Germanic tribes barbaric tribes, called them barbarians. You can say that the Germanic tribes are at the top of the, um, you know, top of development today, because well, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, um, the British, they are all sort of Germanic peoples. You understand? So they are the they are the apex of civilization today. But when the Romans were ruling, where were the Germanic tribes? They were just barbarians somewhere in the, in the forest of Germ Germania. You understand? So different societies have different rates of development. Some are able to you know, push themselves. For example, in China, there were, there were very old civilizations. In fact, I think the development of paper and some other things first happened in China and all those, all those stuff. So there are some societies that are able to push themselves. Others do, do so from uh, interactions with a superior civilization. So they assimilate, they, they take from other civilizations and they become better. You, you, you get it. So in, in that sense, it, what we're seeing is in a way perfectly normal. Not all societies are going to be at the same level of development. But I think that at this stage, we are playing catch up, but our catch up is too slow considering that we're living in, in a jet age, you understand? Considering that technology is changing so fast within, within the twinkle of an eye. So the pace at which we're trying to catch up, that's what I'm having problems with. Not that uh, this society is better than this society for now, because ultimately that is what you would find in any, um, in any sense when you're comparing societies, different societies, with different history, with different culture, with different language, different people, you are going to find that sort of disparity in terms of the levels of their development. Exactly. And it's funny, I, I don't know where I read this, but apparently if Zimbabwe continues at its rate of growth, it will, it will reach development status in 2072 years or something. So it, it, it's true. Each country develops at different rates. And it's so funny that you mentioned Egypt, thinking that the Germanic countries were the barbaric ones and they were at the peak of human civilization as you mentioned but today then they're, they're not are they so even and i think okay chigbo mentions this it, it can fluctuate so much that you can be the superpower today and you could be at the bottom of the scale tomorrow as well so instead of wondering or or or, or, or being concerned with who is at the top why not sort of see what you have see the resources you have change your internal systems which i want to talk about next and see how it can better serve your own people instead of worrying about who did what and who did when. And it's funny because you mentioned um, that when the Europeans, so you were talking about, well, what did they underdevelop? And then you mentioned maybe they may have had an Im impact on our culture, our religion, our um, 
politics and, and this and that. And it's funny because in the second article that I want to explore today, OK, Chigbo is actually arguing that it is because of our customs and, you know, our culture that can serve as a barrier to industrialize, to change. And I can understand that because in a country like um, the UK and I'm sure America as well, that that promotes individual, indivi the individual and they promote individualism and they don't. Um, I don't know if this is right to say, but I think it is. They don't die hard for their culture. Of course, um, depends on different regions you go in the UK where their culture is established. And if you want to live in their community, you have to sort of abide by their codes and, and, and so on. But it's not as tribalistic as some countries in Africa where you are not permitted to marry a certain person from a certain village, not even country, not even you can't marry from this country or this, you know, nation, just tribe, the same country. You can't marry. It's forbidden to marry about from this or that tribe. I was learning about or I heard about a, a concept called the Trokoshi concept. I don't know if it's in Nigeria or Ghana. And if you do something wrong, like marrying out of your village, you can be sent to some far away distant land and basically be a, a child slave. You know, so just little barrier. Well, I say little. It's not really little, is it? These kind of barriers. How can a country move forward to a state of development to which which needs you to be willing to change, to forget what you know knew, you know from before and come out of your comfort zone, come out from your cultural beliefs and actually try something different, move to machinery, um, remove, I don't want to say replace religion because I, I believe in God, but not have so much heavy reliance on religion and spirituality and see that there is a tangible world out here where you need to do certain things to make a living, to be successful, right? How can a great, you know, national change happen if within these tribal um, groups, things are fragmented um, um, in, in their little villages and communities? So what do you think about, about that? You know, on, on, this, on surface value, when you're just looking at this on the surface, you might say, yeah, it's the culture, it's the traditions and all that that's causing all these problems. But I think it goes a little bit deeper than that because there are some very traditional societies that are scientifically developed. If you go to Japan, for example, Japan has been able to marry both their, their, their tradition with science and technology you get. So they may have certain superstitions, they may have certain beliefs that they still adhere to, but it doesn't stop their development. You get it. So uh, I don't think, I, I don't know how we were not, we're not able to marry these two together. But if you even look at, if you look at Europe and America you're talking about, America only became so um, deculturalized or uh, lost some, some of their culture in, in the past few decades america was was a country that was founded on principles of christianity uh, you know the protestant ethic so there was there was culture there was some sense there was a religious sense to the founding think, of the country do you think they lost their culture or their culture has been blended with other cultures well i wouldn't say they lost their culture the culture has changed because culture is dynamic but those traditional things that you're even talking about those traditional things existed in America, traditional things existed in most of Europe and to an extent may still do exist, but they were able to, okay, let's look at Nazi Germany, for example. Nazi Germany was a terrible place for so many, with so many, for so many terrible ideas. There was eugenics, there was racism, there was, those you can say those are terrible cultural practices, but it did not stop them from having brilliant engineers that were trying to make rockets to go to the moon, that were trying to do so many things on, uh, on on the field of science, of technology, and all that. They had terrible social norms. You get so, for example, in in Nazi Germany, obviously a Jew should not get married to a German, and and they're black people too. I think there are some some mixed race children that were called the Rhineland bastards, mixed race children between Germans and and black black people that they were sterilized because they, they were seen to be an inferior class of people so mm -hmm. those were terrible social norms it's just as it's akin to um 
in Nigeria where one village says, oh, you can't marry from this other village. It's, it's almost the same thing. Mm-hmm. But despite the existence of such terrible social norms in those countries, they were still able to develop scientifically, technologically, you know, intellectually in other aspects. So I, I don't think it is totally correlated that it is these practices that holding us back. I'm trying to find the balance. I'm trying to yeah. find that. I'm not seeing it, but I'm, I'm, maybe I'm playing too much of the devil's advocate. But no, that's, that's why. No, not at all. I think you're correct. I think, though, the difference is because you mentioned intellectual development and, and so on, and uh, you mentioned the case of Japan, but they, for example, in most of their um, dealings, business dealings, they deal in English, for example. They speak in English. They might have a translation, a translator, but they understand that, you know, the correspondence, the, you know, communication, sorry, is is in English. It might not be them directly, but they might have um, um, delegates and, and so on. So I understand that that certain cultures, you know, they they don't lose their culture. But I think you said it in some way or another, they assimilate with whoever else from another nation they similar or they meet in the middle but i'm saying all that to say for example in a country um like in nigeria where there are 400 languages these things compounded can cause barriers to your development and just other co- other cultural behaviors and mannerisms for example this is not um this is not a, ni- a case from nigeria but i remember when i worked in Um, sort of a credit card institution and we did an induction for some students and there was a Muslim girl she came in she was one of the university students that wanted to work at our company so it's it was a very minor thing but it made me think about the wider picture so she she was fully dressed in the Muslim attire and my manager sort of greeted her as you would any normal um, you know how you greet people so to shake the hand and she just kind of stood there looking at him like he was supposed to know that she, which I don't think all Muslim girls are like that. But if they are, I can be corrected. I'm happy to be corrected. So he, she stood there just looking at him in his face like, you should know I can't shake your hand. So it was this awkward three second encounter of his hand drawn out and it's a full room with other prospective applicants. And this girl just looking at him like this. So of course she didn't get the job. You know, of course, she didn't get the job. I don't think it was because of that incident specifically, but it was the way it was done. Right. So there's this marriage to culture and there's this you need to understand this is how I do things and I cannot meet you in the middle. And meeting in the middle in that situation doesn't mean that she leaves her culture, forgets who she is and shakes his hand. If it's offensive to her, you know, I cannot judge. But it did mean I apologize. I'm unable to. May, but I will say hello. I will say how are you. And I, I know it's an anecdotal specific, specific example, but I see this on the wider picture where people are unable to leave how they do things. You can't develop. You can't industrialize if you're stuck with with how you do specific things. And I use the marriage outside of a village as an example, but there could be a number of different things where people are unwilling to leave certain religions or religious way of thinking. And it can be any kind of religion because religion can be a barrier to to um, um, industrialize um, to development. For example, if you see that most of um, the apart from America, but most people who are successful, they don't count religion as being very important in their life. But those and there's this argument about black churches and religion in the UK anyway, that they're being exploited because they are poor, because when you're too religious, you sort of think, well, I don't want to, um, I don't need to think about my life here. I just need to think about my, the next life. So then there's no incentive to actually be something great and do something great. And I think you also can't have that culture or religion as a clutch, as a crutch. Okay, yeah, I hear you. I hear you, Ada. And I want to agree with you, but I would have to disagree with you. Um, I don't think inherently it's the culture or the religion, I think there are other factors that play into it. Take China, for example. China has been able to lift more than 100 million people out of poverty in the last two decades. Compared to Nigeria, China is a humongous country. 
and China has more ethnic ethnicities, more languages than Nigeria could ever dream to have. Why is China able to develop and Nigeria not able to develop? If one of the reasons is the ethnic uh, barrier, the language barrier, China has those things too. So you've got to ask yourself, what's at play? About religion, when people say religion plays very little roles in their life, I, I, especially in the West, I think not, because most of the Western ideals were actually formed on a Christian basis. It's only in the last 50 years that people have become sort of militantly atheist. Many Western European countries, when they began their development, were actually very Christian. So, <laughs> so they can't claim that it is the loss of their religion that's made them great. The foundations for their morality, the foundations for their rule of law, the foundations for their society basically was sort of Christian. Some people will say Judeo-Christian traditions and all that, but there was a religious basis somewhat for the founding of these states. And many of them were still religious up until very, quite recently. Development in Europe did not start yesterday. It didn't start when they started becoming atheists. It started even when they were Christians, you understand? So what is happening? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Why is religion so bastardized in places like Africa, where it is now a stumbling block? Because it actually is a stumbling block. But it's not inherently the religion. It's, it's, it's just the melting pot of so many bad ideas you get that's bringing, that's giving the, the picture we're seeing currently, where uh, religious leaders take advantage of people. The, the, because of the economic situations, they exploit people, you get. And if you have critical thinking skills, there is no manner of rubbish that a religious person, a pastor or whatever, an imam tell you that you should not be able to see through the bullshit. It's because people have basically, they, they've abandoned how to think. That's why someone will just tell them this and they will do it. <laughs> you get it. So I am still trying to find where the problem is with the religion in Africa. Why it wasn't a stumbling block. In fact, really, the Christianity was one of the one of the driving force for European colonialism and expansionism because they wanted to spread the gospel to who they called barbaric tribes and all that. And the church and the state were working hand in hand. Many yeah. mission schools in Africa were formed, you know, by by the Catholic Church by priests. The earliest of our, our leaders were trained in these Catholic schools, which the government has turned uh, taken over and they. They've made a mess of it. And I think they are thinking of trying to return those mission schools back to the missionaries. So in a sense, those, those were religious institutions and it did quite well. So something else is going on here. I definitely agree with you. Um, I don't, I, to clarify, I don't think religion is the problem. I think it's a reliance of religion and replacement of certain things you need to do and put in it on religion. So for example, here in in the article, um, he wrote, um, he, he was talking about, um, where was it? One second. So, it is still difficult to make changes that can have economic impact. Vestiges of traditional behaviors remain there and in many other parts of Nigeria. For example, some still believe that visiting a juju priest or a strongly Christian Praying and fasting is a better guarantor of business success than a feasibility study. Now, to back that up, I, I, I was at a church for a, a long time. I was even going to like do missionary work and all that. I worked there. I was a paid employee for ov over a decade. So I will just say that I saw that many people didn't do the things that was required from them to do. And they would rely on praying and fasting. Right. I'm not talking about, because when we talk about reliance of, on, on Christianity or religion and why people um, in these religions are poor, people like to go straight to, well, it's because they give money to the church because of the tithes and the offerings and all these things. I don't believe that. I think is the lack of initiative and it's the lack of um, self-responsibility that you need to actually do <laughs> certain things to, you know, see changes in your life, to have success. You know, it could be little things 
instead of applying for a job or preparing yourself for a job you, you put it in the hands of God and you trust that God is going to give you the words to say just little things like this so you know I, Nigeria is 50% Christianity and 50% Muslim or is it 55 Muslim and I always the numbers always change uh, I is think it, um from official sources it's about 50 percent muslim there may be 45 percent christian and, and then um, other traditional you know, others yeah yeah so when i went to nigeria it was full of churches on every corner so it's not like you mentioned in, in america of course i mean 70 percent of americans i believe are christian or believe you know have a christian faith profess the christian faith and actually believe that it's their christian values that allows them to see success in their life but you know they don't they be you know they're capitalists you know they most of their faith is sort of a materialistic faith let's not let's not sugarcoat that they pray for prosperity they pray for blessings and they actually go out and do what they need to do so I'm agreeing with you in terms of it's not the religion but what is the difference between you know one country and another where both have the same basis of faith but they see different results so I think that's where we're both kind of stuck but I do think okay. it plays a part. So now, this is, I'll bring it back to, I would say it's culture. You now, the simple definition of culture is the way of life of people. So how people choose to do things. And I think a culture is bad. And when I say culture, I don't mean traditions or rules and regulations. I mean the way we do things. For example, we are very hypocritical, even on a religious basis, because yes, People will tell you this is what the scripture says, and then they do the opposite of it. So it means they are not even living up to the standards of the scripture in the first place. So I think that the way Christianity or the way religion is being practiced in Africa, which is now a culture, is a very bad and toxic form of it. It's, it's a bastardized form of the religion. You get, so where you now infuse um, such a heavy emphasis and trust on spiritual things where you vest so much reverence on a quote and unquote man of God. And when he says something, everybody just, you know, everybody takes it. And that man of God is living the life. It's like fella would say, so far, so far for what uh, men enjoy for heaven. You understand? These pastors, they are living, they, ha they have private jets and, and all that. Yeah, they're telling you that all you just need is prayer. And you think that's what you actually need? No. So what happened there is not even the religion. It's, it's a lack of critical thinking. It's, it's the way the, the religion has fused with the culture and it has evolved over time. So the way it is being practiced is totally wrong. So people need to reevaluate things. They need to reevaluate their faith. And they need to... For, I am a Christian, but... I'm able to make that. Uh, I'm able to make that dichotomy. Okay, these are matters of faith, and these are matters of these are other matters, because I think that faith and science and every other thing can be harmonious if you understand the role that they play. Mm -hmm. So, for faith, it is about communion. It's about the deeper meanings of life. It's about uh, spirituality. It's about answering questions of why are we here? You understand? Where are we going to? You understand? It's about answering questions of how do I relate with my neighbor? But it's not about answering questions of how do I make money? It's not about answering questions of how do I create a structure that would last, that people would follow? How do I create a system that is just and fair and not corrupt, that's not nepotic or tribalistic? It's not about those things, but people think it's about those things so they are confusing they're mixing they're mixing things up they're giving things to an area where it's not supposed to be and i think that's one thing the europeans were able to do when they said okay separation of church and state and that separation of church and state was embodied in the words of jesus christ when the disciples came to him and were asking him uh, that oh they're asking for taxes should we pay taxes and then he asked them to give him a coin. And then he gave him a coin. He asked, whose face is this? He said, Caesar's. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I think that's the fundamental basis for the separation of church and state. 
fundamentally, you can give to Caesar what is Caesar. You can give to God what is God's. But when you give to God what is Caesar's, you've messed up the whole thing. Or when you give to Caesar what is God's, you've messed up the whole thing. And I think we are messing it up massively in Africa. Exactly. And yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, I used to speak to people who would have like, they would come to me and say, Ada, I've got a headache. I think the devil is attacking me. You know, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to do this. And it's just a simple question of when's the last time you ate? Oh, I've not eaten for 12 hours because I'm fasting for my prosperity. And it's like just little things like that where common sense is lost because you want to keep the faith. And I think you're right. I think, I mean, we're focusing on um, Christianity, but it can be anything else that removes that common sense, you know, um, even traditional religions, um, you know, which are which involve quite um, weird things and practices. You know, there are still, for example, um, I'm not saying this is what embodies traditional religions, but things such as sacrifices and um, you know, ritual beatings and all these other things, you know, even less than that. But I think people just need to have a sense of rationality. Even when it comes to faith, you have to have a rational faith unless it's it's not faith anymore. But I don't want this to turn into a sermon. But <laughs> I think speaking of culture, because religion is not the only aspect of culture, I think another big part of um, a lot of sub-Saharan African cultures is the tribalism and that even leads to warfare and internal conflict and um, the lack of institutional remedies when, you know, things like crime happens and um, when one is a victim of violence. Because of that instability, I think that is also a barrier to development as well. You know, a country like the UK, you know that if you're a victim of a crime, even though the police are so slow here in dealing with certain things, but there is that certainty that you, there is someone that I can go to that I that can help me, um, and there's a sense of stability um, in a country like this, which leads to security, which leads to freedom, which leads to you know movement of ideas and people freely. But in a place, you know, um, especially in, in Nigeria, I remember when we went there to travel, we were not allowed to go about out and about as we pleased we had to be driven everywhere and that was so weird for me you know anyone would think wow that's great living but it was really weird that to go to you know let's say to the town center I had to be driven I couldn't just get my bus pass or you know and go on a bus and go to go to town right these little things once you compound it you know wider it causes it stifles innovation in my opinion um, I'm not saying individual innovation, but it does have an impact in how a country is overall. It's as simple as that. Once you combine that with difficulties in, in, in trade, um, be it logistical barriers or be it cultural barriers where one tribe can't relate to another tribe, I think it, it does make a difference in how a country develops or not. Now, this will bring me to the question of, is multiculturalism how how good is it really for the development of any society especially of a nation or a country because at times maybe because in this age it has been championed multicultural society multicultural society but most of human societies have been balkanized most of human society have been tribalistic people usually coalesce along a shared ethnic racial or religious identity People coalesce along that line. If you even look at most of the countries in Europe, the way they are structured, they're usually structured along the lines of, okay, ethnic, um, there's a majority, the common core of that nation is a certain ethnicity. Then maybe there are just one or two other tribes and all that, but that is the way it is. Now, I think that one place where I would put some blame on the colonial masters in Africa was their inability to forge a sort of a national sense a national identity in the areas they ruled over. Because primarily, I don't think they were so much concerned with nation building as they were with economic, economic, um, the economic aspect of their empires. They just wanted to make money. And take, take Nigeria, for example. The way they ruled the northern part of the country was 
different from the way they ruled the southern part of the country. So with the northern part, because they already had MEIs and, you know, very strong that, that they could rule with as proxies, they left that system like that, which is still plaguing us today because those emirs and the rest, they are so powerful. They have so much power, you understand. In the southern part of the country where that wasn't so, they didn't, you didn't really have strong kings and all that over people. They sort of instituted another system. You get now these two systems were at variance, and you bring these these two peoples together. You haven't forged a sense of national identity. Most of the north was they didn't even bother to try and educate them because, well, it was the Christian churches that were doing the missionary work and they were doing the education because they didn't want to rock the Muslim north. They they really did not introduce mission schools into the north, and that led to a big problem of you know the northerners being. Um, more illiterate than the southerners you get. So by the time independence came, both sides were not even, they were not seeing eye to eye. Yet the, the political power was structured such that the North would have an overwhelming advantage over the more educated South in the running of the affairs of the country. So that's a recipe for all sorts of disaster you, you get. So that national identity wasn't formed in the first place. And knowing that people are tribal, if you don't try to do that, once you leave, once the influence of the colonial masters leave, everybody will just devolve into a state of trying to grapple for power, trying to grapple for power. Look at the Nigerian Civil War. What caused the Nigerian Civil War? If you look at the first school in 1966, those young officers, Kaduna, Nziegu, Ifejina, and the rest, those young Igbo officers, principally Igbo officers, they had good ideas. They really wanted to make the country great. But they made a fatal mistake in the sense that when they were killing the leaders, the Nigerian leaders there, they killed mostly Northern Muslim leaders, leaving the mostly Christian Igbo leaders at the top untouched. Either they were out of the country or somehow. I don't know whether it was by design or... But that sparked sort of a distrust, which is still plaguing us today because the Northerners saw it as an ethnic... It was, it was an mm. attack on their ethnicity. Mm. And within a couple of months, they, they did their own coup that killed the Igbo president at that time. And things as that mutual suspicion is still there till this date. That was the seed for that mutual suspicion where the North doesn't trust the East because of that. You get so if 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 that national identity, that sense of nationality was there in the first place, nobody would be thinking along so much emphasis on the ethnic lines. You get so. However, that is in the past. We can't we, we can't undo the past. What is done is done. The question is, how do we fix the problems we have currently? And I think that we are not ready to fix the problems we have. We're not, we're not ready. We are not ready because it's just such a mess. Now it's about the money. It's about, it's about the money. Politicians are going there for the money. There's this road um, that leads to my dad's place uh, along this um, Lagos, Jebode Road. Now that road has been a mess since I came to Lagos. That road is a nightmare. Well, do you know that because elections is coming, they fixed that road within... I, I, I didn't even... The last time I went to my parents' place, the place was a total mess. And the next a couple of... Maybe a month or so that I went there again, I could not believe that that road was that good. I didn't know that it could do such a good job. So this is something that they've left for years. But just because elections were around the corner and they needed the votes from such places, they did a fantastic job. So what was holding them from doing that job all this while? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I think that's not unique to Nigeria anyway. I think when elections come around, that's where things get done. So I think, I think that's definitely not unique to Nigeria. But I guess the last point I just want to quickly explore with you, because you mentioned the, the, the most negative thing about Britain ruling um, or colonizing um, Africa was not leaving that national that that national identity. I I think the biggest mistake was them trying to rule in the first place. I think the biggest mistake was the whole scramble for ha Africa situation. I think the biggest mistake was, um, for example, you know, having a 
a meet the Europeans having a meeting people might be surprised at me saying this but it's true Europeans having a meeting with no African person present and they're literally deciding the fate of Africa and who gets what I I understand trade I do but I think that's what caused the issue because though yes I know the argument of colonization is well these were unsettled and unstable societies before the Europeans came but if you think about it, the Europeans coming and actually having political and institutional influence on these countries could have been what exacerbated the tribalism. Because like you mentioned, um, you know, you have coalitions with the Europeans, but then one, Nigeria is naturally tribalistic. So when the Europeans go there, they don't go, think that they're going to you know, Nigeria as a whole, I'm working with this group, so that, that group is representing Nigeria as a whole. No, so that's what causes or deepens the friction amongst groups. So what do, you, what do you say to that? So you say the, you know, the worst thing they did was not, you know, leaving that national, like unified national identity. And I say, well, that's not up to them. And it's not up to them to decide, you know, that there is a need for national identity in the first place. Now they can be now there should be, you know, mutual respect, you know, there shouldn't be warfare, but lack of warfare doesn't mean unity. I don't think that's that's necessarily the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so I still disagree with you. <laughs> that's why I, I like think... talking to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that colonialism was the worst thing. I think what I said earlier, not leaving the national identity was the worst thing because that was basically how business was done in the world then. People conquer other people. They impose their ideals, they impose their rules. It's only recently that we, it's no longer fashionable for countries to conquer other countries. Like what Russia is doing, everybody's shouting. And, but that's the way things have always been. That was business as usual. That was business as usual in that time. People conquered other people and then they imposed their rules, their ideals. And so the thing is, now it has happened. What naturally happens has happened. But what do you do with that when you've conquered the people? What do you do? Do you leave them more fragmented than you met them? Or do you put a strong system in place? So their failure to put in nationals, and you can see this replicated all over many countries in Africa where the borders were just drawn arbitrarily based on spheres of influence we get. Well, if the African tribes had the power, they would conquer other tribes as well. I mean, the Benin kingdom, they conquered other kingdoms, smaller kingdoms close to them, the Yoruba kingdoms themselves, even the, the northern, the House of Fulani kingdoms in the north, they did that as well. People had that desire to conquer other people and to bring them under their rule. So I think that was business as usual. But business as usual took us very close into this, this age we find ourselves and they just left without, you know, you know, forging that national sense. So I think it would have happened one way or the other. The colonization would have happened one way or the other because that was the way business was being done. I don't think that's where I will strongly disagree. I don't think it's up to an outsider or external force or Europeans to forge a national identity. I believe it doesn't, it doesn't I believe, matter. I understand. I be, for example, Ethiopia, Italy tried to take over Ethiopia. Italy, you know, gave guns, you know, to the opposition of the ruling um, party, whatever at that time, it, for the purposes of dividing the nation. But it was Ethiopia that said, no, we are going to, we may disagree on any other thing, but when it comes to, you know, our national identity on this on this point, we it's up to us. It wasn't up to another force. And Ethiopia was the only country that wasn't colonized by the Europeans. So I'm not Good. saying, I'm not saying in terms of resistance, you know, that's a separate topic. I'm talking just about national ident national but, identity. But the thing is, you're making my point because Ethiopia had a national identity. But they it wasn't principally... forced by the Europeans. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Their national identity predated the Europeans. What is the Nigerian national identity before the Europeans came? There was no Nigeria. There was no Nigerian national identity. It was just different tribes put together. So what, what are you going to protect? What are you going to fight for? But the Ethiopians had a strong, a long history of having an independent state. 
which was sort of homogeneous, maybe racially homogeneous, and also culturally Christian as well. So they had something, they had an identity that predated Europeans coming to their shores. Most of, most of the other countries in Africa did not have that. So what was there to fight for? Yeah, I get you. Okay. So that's it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good, one. Was a good so, one. So how do we conclude? The, the reason for underdevelopment is you say, what do you, what's your last word? What's your last conclusion? I mean, this is a whole series. I hope to have you on again in a few of them um i'm still going to explore so many there's so many different aspects to this but in the context of our conversation today what would you say is the cause of some of africa's underdevelopment well i would say it's a mixture of many things i would say it's a mixture of uh, geography mixture of our history uh, mixture of uh, colonialism mixture of our culture it's a mixture of all these factors but what is done is done. We can't go back to history, no matter how much the contribution of colonialism is or was to our underdevelopment. We cannot fix history. We can't go back in time to fix history. We can only work from here out. <clears throat> we can only work from here out. So we we'll ask ourselves, what can we do now to change things, to change our situation? I, I know Nigerians are not people who are so into the blame game thing. That's one thing at least I can give them credit for. They're not into the blame game thing. Until they come here, Charles. Until yeah, yeah. they come here. <laughs> and by the way, I, I made this, I don't know if you've read my novel, but mm -hmm. my novel, Hotel Shendam, even though it's a crime fiction novel, but also it um, featured a debate on race and colonialism, sort of what we just talked about here. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I give very strong points for, you know, this side arguing that, European colonialism is what cost, is the cost of African wars, and the other side arguing the opposite. So I give you know, sort of a fair, balanced, very strong argument for both positions. I think it's, it's, it's worth a read. Anyone should try and, and get the book. Maybe I'll send I, the link to you. So. Do. Yeah, of course. Send it yeah. to me. I'll put it in the description. Yeah. So it, when you read that book, you see that it crystallizes. My ideas about this is crystallized in that book. It's a fiction book, but... It addresses some of the some of the things that we've talked about here. So it's a mixture of so many factors. But I don't believe in dwelling in the past. I believe in you know looking forward. What do we do from here out? And we have to fix the problem of corruption, of nepotism. We have to fix the problem of tribalism because we, this is the country we have. This is the country we have. It's not going anywhere. So let us make the most of the situation we find ourselves. So that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Charles. It's so great to have you. You're so knowledgeable on so many different things. And I learned so much from you. And I'm sure many of many people watching and listening on the podcast as well will learn as well. And I will put your book link. I, I need to get it. I have so many books to get. I will get it. Dr. Sheena's just done hers as well. Um, so I need and she emailed me about it. So I need to get all your books to read and educate and enlighten myself. <laughs> if you get any more enlightened than this you become the sun yeah really That's, yeah there's so much we don't know right we think we know i thought i when i read before i read okay chickbo's blog before i met all of you which i you know i'm part of your discord and i've learned so much from you guys as well you know about the world about people you know we we know the basics right we know the how to summarize some things but you know, when you go into the detail of how things are and how people are and how people think, it's just it's just phenomenal. And I don't I feel so sorry for people who don't have a, a, a thirst for knowledge, a curiosity to learn more outside of what they think they know because of that fear that they're somehow betraying who they are or their values. And learning something different isn't a betrayal. You know, it's wouldn't you rather want to know what else? you don't know than just to be stuck in your bubble and it's it's really sad it's really sad